edition of On The Pen. I'm your host, Dave Knapp, man on the Manjaro. That's why I'm here. You are on the pen. That's why you're here with Govi Saxenda, Victoza, Trulicity, Manjaro, Zepbound. I like to give it just a minute or two here to get a quorum of people going here when I go live. This is kind of an unplanned live, but there's a couple topics that I wanted to hit on tonight and also give you a, a chance to ask questions, interface with me for a few minutes here tonight while I had a little pocket of time to go live. I hope you all have had a great 4th of July weekend. I hope that you've enjoyed a lot of family, a lot of grilling, a lot of celebrating what it means to be uh, American and those who have uh, sacrificed so much for us to have the freedoms that we have here. Tay, Marty, Rachi, welcome. So I've got a couple topics that I wanted to delve into with you tonight. The first topic being this this topic on the Wigovi and Ozempic being related uh, to a rare eye condition that causes blindness. Now, I made a breaking news video on this. I definitely went into more detail on my YouTube channel than I did on TikTok. That's always the case, right? We delve deeper into the topics here. That's why we love YouTube, because there's, there's an opportunity to explain nuance here. Um, I did take a little heat for that video because a lot of people uh, thought that it was fear-mongering. Now, a couple of things that I want to, hey, Sue the Dude, welcome, how are you, buddy? Lil Chi, Linda. I want to take just a moment to, to explain something right off the bat. Now, when I talk about these medications, we talk about these medications in terms of the life-changing benefits that so many people are experiencing from Wigovi, Sexenda, Victoza, Trulicity, Majaro, Zepbound, all of the GLP-1 and GIP drugs that are on the market that are absolutely unequivocally changing the game for people. But I think it's really important when there's a potential signal uh, for something that could cause certain people harm within certain patient demographics. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a medical provider, but when we see news that could potentially affect people, I think it's important to share it. And so let's talk a little bit about um, that study and, and put it into a little bit of context. So. Uh, the study came out, it was done in conjunction with uh, Harvard Health. It was a Massachusetts eye and ear center that had 16,000 patients. They boiled this patient data set down to about uh, roughly 2,000 people with about 50%, roughly 40% 40 diabetic, 50, uh, 60% non-diabetic, but overweight. And what they found was a eight-fold increase in this rare eye condition that can lead to sudden blindness, right? And so the researchers said, I said in my video, this all needs to be looked at deeper, but I do think that it is important that these types of signals are addressed when there is news that doesn't necessarily suit the narrative of these things being the best thing on the planet. I think we need to know, and I as a content creator owe it to you to share that information with you. Now, again, this, uh, is this a reason to get off the medication for most people? Absolutely not. Does this pose a much greater in, uh, danger to people generally to go blind? Probably not, but this needs to be looked at, right? Because an eightfold increase in the occurrence of NAION, uh, which is a really rare condition. Basically what it does is it cuts off the blood supply to the optic nerve and can cause sudden blindness. So I brought you this information because I think that it's important to bring that to the community. That said, uh, this kind of condition, much more common in type two diabetics than the general population. And it's also very rare. It's like one in 10,000 people that this affects, uh, but uh, important nonetheless. So I just wanted to kind of lead tonight's live with saying, you're always going to, if there's good news, bad news, you're always going to get it from me because I think that's super important to, to not just share the good, but the bad and the ugly too, uh, even if it doesn't suit the narrative of, of the game-changing medication that this is, right? Which it is, and I still firmly believe that is, and I believe that this ultimately poses a very uh, insignificant risk to the, the most um, people, right? And I agree, Linda said, in bringing information should not be considered fear-mongering. I 100% agree with that. So I think, um, I think that it is really important to bring this information. Now that said, the ambulance chasers are all over this. Just today, uh, there are advertisements going around on Facebook, on Instagram, they're already trying to find people that have had any sort of eye condition and trying to marry that to GLP-1 use. And so I think it's very interesting. You've seen 
no time wasted, no time wasted uh, from the opportunistic uh, lawyers to jump on the bandwagon to try to make money. So uh, do I think this could get spun in the media in a way that uh, is a bit disingenuous to the study? Yeah, because the study was a post-market study. Like they, they looked at existing data from patients uh, through patient health records and put kind of compiled this data and, and were looking for trends, right? And they found one. And so I think it's important that this get looked at again. Now, Let's push this conversation to the side because there's another thing that's sort of come up in the comments, both on YouTube and on TikTok, that I really think is important to address here. So one of the things that people say, because uh, many, many people don't think that it is important to cover the things about these medications that can be maybe a little less savory, right? They say these medications have been around for 20 years. If there was an issue, it would have already popped up. So I would take a little bit of issue with that um, you know, kind of outside of this, this issue with the eye. Uh, and I would take issue with the idea that, that these medications have all been around for 20 years. Exenatide was the first GLP-1 that came out. It's a daily GLP-1. And that's the one that, that came from Gila Monster Venom, right? It's an it's a analog to this peptide in Gila Monster Venom that brought down blood sugars and was ultimately brought to, to market under Exenatide, the brand name Bayetta, right? Hey, Sabrina, how are you tonight? Good to have you here. Um, I've only got a couple minutes to get through the rest of what I wanted to get through, so I'm gonna try to blow through it, but thank you all for being here. Hit that like, hit that bell, hit that sub if you're just coming in. Really appreciate it. Jay Neb, how are you tonight? I missed you all on Thursday night. I just wanted to jump on live here and cover a couple things. So, okay, so 20 years ago, of course, Exenatide came out. It's a GLP-1. Then you saw the evolution, right, of Exenatide. You saw, ultimately, we got liraglutide, uh, Saxenda and Victoza from Novo Nordisk we got, and those were also daily shots. You see those are now on generic. Um, then we saw dulaglutide, which was the first weekly GLP-1 injection for type 2 diabetes. That's Trulicity being offered by Novo Nordisk, right? Then you saw the next generation of, of weekly shots come out in semaglutide, which is basically liraglutide with a few molecules changed to make semaglutide in Ozempic and Wagovi, right? And that really took off. Now Ozempic is sort of part of the main vernacular in the United States. It's like a household name. So all of those drugs, yes, those that class of medication has been around for 20 years with lots of studies, lots of clinical trials, and then lots of post-market data to sort of back up the safety and effect efficacy of these medications. Now, I would take a little umbrage when people throw in, yes, I said umbrage, that happened. It's Saturday night. Um, we use big words on Saturday night. So I take a little bit of umbrage with the idea that terzepatide has been around for 20 years because it simply hasn't. Where everything that came before it was a GLP-1 and extric extricably so, right? They were just GLP-1 medications, GLP-1 analogs. Terzepatide is actually mostly a GIP medication. And, it, and there's nothing before that to compare it to. Now, GIP is another incretin hormone, just like GLP-1, right? But we all know if you've been on semaglutide and then you've been on terzepatide, you know there's a huge difference between those two medications. So GLP-1 uh, really, uh, in my own personal experience, acts as more of a blunt object against hunger. Um, really, you feel it in your gut when you take it. Where terzepatide, some people would say, well, that's how it is for terzepatide with me, but most people really describe terzepatide as something that really happens magically in the brain, right? The tuning down of food noise, right? So all of that constant thought processes going on about the food that you're gonna eat, thinking about the next meal while you're eating a meal, food noise, right? And, and GIP has a really profound effect on turning that down, but it also has some other things. There are GIP receptors in your bones. You don't have GLP-1 receptors in your bones, right? And so maybe it'll be better for osteoarthritis. We see a study coming out about osteoarthritis and, and that could be a potential backdoor indication for, um, for Medicare ultimately. But I don't, wanna, I don't want to have people throw in terzepatide with a class of medication that's been around for 20 years. It's only been around for a couple of years, um, you know, probably six, seven years if you're counting the clinical trials, uh, but definitely not 20 years. And post-market, we're only a couple years, right? So when we're talking about uh, incretin receptor agonists, inc incretin mimetics, yes, GLP-1 medications have been around for 20 years with a great safety profile, right? Mostly people experience GI side effects 
and most people experience a lot of pleasant side effects like a great weight loss, great glucose control, decreased insulin uh, levels on balance, all those things. Hey, Allie, hey, Emmy, it's so good to have you here tonight. I'm gonna jump off here in just a minute, but I wanted to get through uh, just a couple thoughts that I was having tonight. Uh, with GL GLP-1, we have that history. With GIP, we actually don't. So while there are a lot of positive things, sleep apnea, uh, alleviated, right? It's melting liver fat, right? It's it's turning around mash. It is reducing inflammation. It is decreasing weight on average about 22%. So it's doing a lot of really great things. Love you, Emmy. It's so good to have you here. It's so good to see you in the chat. So with that, potentially come some different signals maybe that we could see on the negative side with GIP. And I want you to know as my audience, like I'm not gonna shy away from that kind of news when it comes out. Now the I thing is about semaglutide. It's not, it was specific to semaglutide. It was specific to GLP-1 analog um, where, like I said, Manjaro, terzepatide, Zepbound is a mostly a GIP drug. It's a five to one ratio. So it's mostly agonizing agonizing, is that a word? I mean, antagonizing uh, GIP receptors in your body. And so um, there's a lot of positive benefits that people experience from that, but over time, could we see other things that maybe we didn't see with the previous generation, semaglutide, liraglutide, dulaglutide, exenatide? We absolutely could. And I, and I just want you to know that you're going to hear about that from me and it's not always uh, just the positive news. But that all said, um, I, I really, really believe that these medications for the vast swath of the population are gonna be very, very safe medications to take. Game-changing, life-changing. You all know that I believe that, but I just felt compelled to come on and say um, that uh, because that news broke this week on the semaglutide that you're always gonna get the straight rub with me. Um, I'm not gonna shy away from news even if it doesn't fit, you know, the happy kind of... Uh, kind of news that you want to hear all the time. I just want you to know that you're going to get the news from me regardless. So I hope that helps to put that into context. Uh, I, I just want you all to be, in, I want to be informed personally. I want you all to be informed. I know that you trust me for that. I thank you for trusting me for that. Thank you so much for the opportunity that you give me to have this platform. I really appreciate it. Like I said, I hope you all have a great 4th of July weekend. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your uh, weekend with your family, your, your friends, um, I hope that you do something uh, that um, does honor to the wonderful country that we live in, and I just really appreciate it. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being the best part of what I do at On The Pen. Really appreciate you. Uh, before you go, hit that like button, hit that thumbs up button, send this to somebody who might find it helpful, and I hope that we'll see you again on Thursday night this week, Thursday night, 9 o'clock Central, On The Pen Live. Hope you enjoyed this past uh, pre-recorded interview with Candice, the T on GLP. Uh, I got to go back and rewatch that and catch the chat. I would love to catch up with what you all had to say while I was gone. But son had a great birthday. Cooper turned nine years old. Uh, we celebrated and we've been celebrating all weekend. They're out watching a neighborhood movie right now, which is why I had a little pocket of time to do this. So thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being here. And we will catch you all on the next 